Welcome to your 2023 work recap. This year, you've been to 127 sync meetings. You spent 56 minutes searching for files and almost missed eight deadlines. Yikes. 2024 can and should sound different. With Monday.com, you can work together easily, collaborate and share data, files, and updates. So all work happens in one place and everyone's on the same page. Go to Monday.com or tap the banner to learn more. For the ones who get it done, the most important part is the one you need now. And the best partner is the one who can deliver. That's why millions of maintenance and repair pros trust Granger, Because we have professional-grade supplies for every industry, even hard-to-find products. And we have same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders. But most importantly, we have an unwavering commitment to help keep you up and running. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Hello, and thank you for listening to the History of World War II podcast, Episode 452, Operation Typhoon, All or Nothing. Last time, the Germans had launched another attack on November 15th, utilizing the whole of Army Group Center. The idea was for the two flanks to dominate the land above and below the capital, while von Bock's main force drove straight at Moscow. This was it. And now that the attack was underway, the fighting to the north of the main road that led to Moscow looked more favorable as each day passed. Remember Devotnor's cavalry corps that was to attack Hopner's units? Well, it didn't turn out to be the Russian victory that Zhukov was hoping for. True, Hopner's men had been attacked just before the cavalry went in, and the Germans were slowed by this, but that was it. And this failure by the Russians handed them another one. Yes, Hopner had been slowed down, but the focus on him allowed Reinhardt, the commander of the 41st Panzer Corps, to get in between the 16th and 30th Soviet armies to cause all kinds of stress. About 20 miles or 32 kilometers due west of Moscow is the town of Zvengorod, and in front of it was the right flank of the Soviet 5th Army under General L.A. Kvorov. Trying to keep up with the success of Hopner's left flank advance, Reinhardt came in at Zvengorod on November 19th. Yet the initial German thrust here was blunted. But the Russians knew the Germans would be back. The fate of the town was still in 5th Army's hands. Again, the town had been attacked, but not taken. So Zhukov, on the 21st of November, sent Rokozovsky himself to help with the worsening situation to the north of Zvengorod, specifically to Solnek Nogorsk, and just to the north of that, Klin. Rokozovsky rushed out, but he needn't have worried. Solnek Nogorsk fell while he was en route, and Klin fell the next day, on the 22nd. The Nazi noose was tightening around Moscow. As tenuous as the center was, everyone in Moscow could see that it was their flanks that threatened to let loose a German tidal wave. But not all this was due to German aggression. No, Soviet mistakes still lingered nearby. For example, around this time, the commander of the Soviet 30th Army, for some inexplicable reason, swung a part of his line to face north. Suddenly, there was a gap created, and the eager Reinhardt soon found it. During the next few days, the 41st and 46th Panzer Corps would cross over the frozen Istra Reservoir, located about 9 miles or 14 kilometers south by southwest of the just-captured Solnechnogorsk, and 25 miles or 40 kilometers to the northwest of Moscow. To this, Stalin threw in everything, including the kitchen sink. Ordering them in, soon all reserves, even Air Force personnel, were marching into the gap left by German violence and Soviet incompetence. But it was this very combination that allowed Army Group Center to reach out towards Moscow to their greatest extent so far. On November 27th, Colonel Hasso von Manteffel, a part of the 7th Panzer Division, crossed over the Volga 
at Yak Roma, due north of Moscow, by some 30 miles or 48 kilometers. This was significant, as the Volga was a part of the waterways helping to stop or slow down the Germans from getting to a point that they could then swing around and approach the capital from the rear. To be able to do this would allow supplies to be cut from sustaining the War Nerves Center and Stalin's headquarters. But what happened next was a sign of the coming times. Not only was von Manteffel down to just 36 operational tanks, but Stalin had a nasty surprise for these meddlesome panzers. Only recently, out of sheer desperation, did the Stavka decide to create shock armies. These had been discussed before the war, but now they were in the midst of becoming a reality. The idea was for these armies to overcome difficult defensive dispositions in order to create a tactical penetration of sufficient breadth and depth to permit the commitment of mobile formations for deep exploitation. In other words, they were to act as a fire brigade. So their implementation would start at a troubled spot, but the idea was to turn a disadvantage into another disadvantage, but this one for the enemy. This mass of men would come in, disrupt the enemy's attack plan, and through sheer numbers and momentum, smash the enemy's spearhead, create a hole, enlarge it, and then send mobile units into the hole to take as much territory as they could before the enemy could recompose themselves. Thus, the first shock army, currently being built out of seven rifle brigades and 11 ski battalions, but they were being put together for another mission, was thrown into this breach between the 16th and 30th armies. So, when von Manteffel's 36 panzers reached Yak Roma on the 27th, they found themselves leaving two days later. Despite this local success, the Stavka still had much to worry about, as elements of the 2nd Panzer Division entered and held Krasnia Polyana, modern-day Lubnia, practically due north of Moscow, but by only some 12 miles, or 19 kilometers away, from the Kremlin itself. Still, this was forward movement by the Germans, again like with von Manteffel at Yograma, but their success was fleeting as the 1st Shock and 20th Armies rushed in and stopped the Germans from going any further or from even consolidating what they had. On a side note, the 20th Army was led by a General Andre Vlazov, but this moment is not what he is known for, but more on him later. With this last offensive being worn down, Hopner called for a three-day halt to rest, resupply, and reevaluate. Clearly, there were more Russian troops than supposed. The idea was to regroup and then start up again and improve on their rather impressive gains. But it was not to be. Before those three days were up, Stalin would launch his own offensive with a goal of undoing all of the German gains in the last month. Turning to the south now, remember when Tula, just over 100 miles due south of Moscow, was attacked on November 18th? This helped create that 30-mile-wide gap in the Soviets' defensive line, which is when the tired Germans, well, not so much ran into the Siberian divisions, but were themselves run into. Guderian cursed, but would write that they, the Siberians, were keen for battle and well-trained and he was about to find out how keen they were. On November 22nd, after a few days of not being able to push into Tula, Guderian stopped advancing, and he had plenty of good reasons. But on the 23rd, von Bock flew down to Guderian to see if he could get this fast Heinz to be a more determined fast Heinz. Guderian, in response, listed his reasons for his lack of advancement. To wit, von Bock said, look, I know it's tough, but can you at least make it to Kolomna, which is about 65 miles or 104 kilometers to the northeast of Tula, and would put the panzers just past Moscow, again, to be able to attack the capital from the rear. Yet, this was another impossible task, set by a man who wanted this building nightmare over and who wanted to be his country's next hero. Humans 
even tough men in mud-covered uniforms, are emotional creatures. But Kolomna was safe, or was it? When Guderian came at Tula, its defenders, made up of workers' brigades and NKVD units, had stopped him cold. How? They feared Stalin more than those panzers. Then Guderian remembered that his order from von Bock was to reach Kolomna as opposed to taking Tula, so he pushed a little bit to the east beneath the town rather than to the northeast, and when relatively free of Soviet defenders from the town, he started heading north again. This allowed him to reach Vennev on November 24th, the first town past Tula. He and von Bock considered his offensive was back on. As the saying goes, a drowning man will even grab at the tip of a sword. Now pushing to the northeast, the second panzer army reached Kashira, a mere 10 miles or 16 kilometers short of Kolomna. After that, Bolden's 50th Soviet Army reached the area, but the panzers and their support units mauled the 50th pretty badly, which was now not in a position to stop the panzers. On the other hand, all that fighting and their losses got the attention of General Zhukov, the Iron Man. But first, the reason von Bock wanted Guderian to reach Kolomna was because right behind it was the Moskva River, as that is the last major waterway in the area. Once beyond it, if the Germans managed to get that far, they could then turn and make a run for Moscow's rear without having to fear another blown bridge in their path. But again, the Panzers would not make it that far. And now that Zhukov was looking south, he pulled out one of his last reserve units, the 1st Guards Cavalry Corps, and sent them to Kashira, as they arrived mere hours before the 17th Panzer Division did. And above them was an unusually large number of close support aircraft. Zhukov wasn't playing. The 1st Guards Cavalrymen of General Bevlov might not have retaken the town, but they did scatter a few of the 17th Division's outposts. And then what did the Russian horsemen do? They dashed into the midst that was Army Group Center's rear areas, and they would stay there for five months, causing chaos and mayhem among the enemy's supply lines. But going back a few days and back to the Tula area, where men under Bolden held the town, Guderian had had enough. He gathered up what was left of the 3rd and 4th Panzer Divisions, about 110 tanks, and again put them under Kampfgrupp Eberbach, or Ballergrupp Eberbach, the last name of General Heinrich Eberbach, who had been doing solid work thus far. Battlegroup Eberbach was to make a counterclockwise sweep around Tula, while 43rd Army Corps would match this with a clockwise sweep. But here, Guderian, now truly frustrated, would lead this attack himself. If this worked out, Tula, seemingly impervious to a direct attack, might wither if surrounded. But here, Guderian got to experience what his men had been going through recently fighting in temperatures far below zero degrees Celsius. Yet somehow, even with the double swing around Tula, the Soviet 340th Rifle and 112th Tank Divisions held open a corridor that the Germans simply could not crush. Guderian, angered by everything around him now, blamed von Kluge for his slowness, which could have helped in the area. But, as von Bock made clear to Guderian, von Kluge wasn't being pessimistic. He was simply out of fuel. He was down on his number of men and panzers, and he was constantly being harassed by Soviet air power. He, Kluge, was not the problem. And then, an earlier madness repeated itself as the temperatures dropped, along with the German sense of reality. On the far right of Army Group Center, the Second Army was pushing ahead. At its head was not von Weeks, who was sick. No, he was replaced by a Colonel General Rudolf Schmidt, and the Second Army had started out well enough. First, it had pushed aside, no small feat, 
the Soviet 3rd and 13th Army, and was making for Varunze, located about 130 miles or 209 kilometers south by southeast of Tula. The point is, the town was so far behind the current lines that this, too, was another pipe dream. Between the weather, Soviet domination of the air, and a lack of regular fuel supplies, this endeavor was also brought to a halt at the end of November. And, as had happened on Army Group Center's left flank earlier, Army Group South's far left flank was supposed to be working with Schmidt, but they had their own problems, so could not contribute to Schmidt's goal, unrealistic as it was. Thus were the flanking attacks stalled, which would be tolerable if the main show, that is, von Bock's Schwerpunkt, or focal point, literally heavy point, his attack on the center, went well. But irony will step in for a laugh, because, and not that it probably would have made a difference, one of von Bock's officers will not only delay with one of his flanking attacks, but for his pains, he will be given von Bock's job in a matter of days. He who lives by the sword dies by the sword. Postscript. General Andrei Vlazov, commander of the Soviet 20th Army that worked with the 1st Shock Army, would later be captured trying to help lift the siege of Leningrad. And when he became a prisoner, he defected to Nazi Germany. Now on their side, he became the leader of the Russian Liberation Army. This was mostly an intellectual exercise versus a real formation of men. But it did allow the Germans to say to Soviet soldiers, hey, why die? You should surrender and join the Russian Liberation Army under General Vlazov. He will lead you to freedom. This, as you can imagine, rarely worked, but by 1944, the Germans could see how this war was going to play out, if something did not change. And so that year, Heinrich Himmler created a real army of collaborationists, officially the ROA. But then Vlazov changed sides again in May 1945, when the ROA, following his orders, helped fight the Germans in the Prague Uprising. Soon after, he was captured by Soviet troops, with the Americans helping. But then he was given to the Soviets, who promptly tortured, tried, and then hanged him. Greetings, everyone, from Central Virginia. So, as you can probably tell by my rather sexy voice, yeah, I've got something. So, the nose has stopped up, but I'm doing the best I can. So, hopefully that wasn't too off-putting. Anyway, I'd like to say hi to some new members and those who have donated. Let's see here. The latest members. Andrew Nauman from Salisbury, Maryland. Thank you very much, Andrew. Uh, Steve Kosia, Kosia, I'm not sure how to say it, from Havertown, Pennsylvania. Kosia Communications is where he spends his days. So thank you very much, Steve. As far as donations, uh, see, there's a Stephen Mullet. Thank you very much, Stephen. And a James Oswald, who recently found uh, the podcast. He's burning through them. He, had, he sent me a very nice message about him and his dad watching old World War II series, and he's uh, enjoying the podcast a lot. So, James, thank you very much. That's why I'm doing this. So, um, as I said on some interview many, many years ago, I got an iPod. I was waiting for someone else to start a World War II podcast, like Mike Duncan's History of Rome. It did not come out. So out of sheer frustration or whatever, I decided to start my own. But anyway, that's just a little tidbit. Take care, everyone, and we will see you soon with the last of the Army Group Center. Then we'll go to Army Group South, catch them up, and then we'll just go at it. Take care, everyone. Did you know at Kroger, shopping online with pickup and delivery is the same as shopping in-store? Same low prices, same personalized deals, same rewards, with no hidden fees or markups on your same family favorites, like honey crisp apples and pasta sauce. The only difference is you don't have to put on shoes. Start your cart today at Kroger.com. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Restrictions apply. See site for details.